Hello all, we're back on Galvin Valley, still on field 42, trying to wrap up our harvest, get through it. I know it's been a long slog in this particular field. Yeah, we're getting down to the last little bit, which means the combine's going to have a little difficulty finishing off the last little triangle, but, but it'll get it. I gotta take this home. I don't know if anybody noticed, but somebody repaired all of our equipment. <laughs> At the end of the last video, I got out of the game and I I did a manual repair in the safe game file. Let's just say that's how I handled it. In the last video, I was kind of talking about uh, my life on the farm again. I have no idea if any of this is of interest to anyone. Maybe in some ways I'm recording this and I get some to ache and listen to this and know a little bit about uh, what their dad did. But I was talking about working at Lone Oak and some of the things that we would do in the spring, you know, getting out of school and the logging that we did and there's a lot that could be shared on all that and maybe it's, if, if additional videos are made uh, more things can be shared but eventually I mean we'd get through the spring the grass would get pollinated and and oh by the way I am <laughs> I work seven eight years on this farm and I am allergic basically to grass and pollen so you know, this time of year, when I'm recording this, it's in June. And right now, it's kind of rainy, so that's kept a lot of the grass pollen down. But, but I can have a hard time this time of year. It makes me, my eyes water in particular. It's like I can't already stop crying. And my tear ducts get all plugged up. And it's a royal pain in the neck. You know, I get stuffed up. It's hard to breathe sometimes. Sleeping's diffi with difficulty. And you know, there's a little medication I can take that helps with it. But I almost think I handled it better back in the day. There's something about that. You know, when you're allergic to something, you get exposed to a little bit of it. And, you know, I guess the adage they say, you know, what uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger or something to that effect. And I inhaled a lot of dust and pollen over the years just kind of working in that environment. And... For all I know, I did uh, damage to myself. Oh, look at that. All done. Very good. I'm going to try to get him off. There we go. Got to press the right button. I'll go up and get tractor here. It's kind of still on. Actually, he's pretty full. I don't know why he didn't just head down over the hill and sell it, but he didn't. So actually, growing up, because of my allergies, I think my father was also allergic a little bit to it. I tell you what, it can get you out of some work sometimes, too. You know, there's part of uh, some of the field work that needs to happen with grass is, you know, chemicals can only work to a certain level. There are some grasses that, if you put a chemical on them, you may kill it, but you'll kill all the good stuff, too. So if you really want to get it out and have it removed, you, you need to go do it by hand. So... When uh, when the pollen was out, um, I could not handle, you know, going into the fields. Um, you know, for the most part, um, some of this grass, you know, maybe it comes to your knees. It, it's amazing the variability in height of different kinds of grasses. A lot of what uh, they farmed on uh, Lone Oak was 
fine fescues for many, many years. And by fine, I mean it was maybe it would come up to your knees, but it was really fine stock. I mean, this is the kind of stuff you would see in your yards a lot of times. Um, and then there was tall grasses, you know, they don't call it tall fescue without reason. And a lot of times you go out and stand in that, it could be up to your chest or even higher, depending on the variety. And <clears throat> and there was also other varieties that uh, they might have had at, at varying times. So you go out into this, if you had allergic reactions to being out there, I, mean, I would get the hives, have more difficulty breathing. I mean, it really wasn't a, a good thing to, to be out there. Ooh, hopefully this car can get by. And why is my tractor slipping? Oh, you decided to explore the ditch. Well, once again, we are going to have to... Hmm, oh, there's a gate over there. Maybe if I just put him in the field... To do. I don't like to do that, but what else can I do? I suppose I could go use that mod that's a uh, chain. That'd take all kinds of time, though. Maybe I'll do it some other time. I'm going to let that car go by because I don't want to tangle with him. That's probably the reason I ended up in the ditch. He probably came up behind and nudged me into it. So I'm going to send. There we go. Good, good, good. Back to my combine. I don't know why my indicators turned off. I'm just going to head it to the next field. So when I worked up at Lone Oak, um, you know, I just tried to stay medicated as well as I could to fight, you know, whatever allergies I had. But man, I still inhaled a ton of dust. There was all kinds of things <coughs> probably would have been better that I didn't do. Probably should have worn more masks for when it was in dusty conditions, worn more earplugs when there was noise. So I'm sure at some point I'm uh, going to be paying a little bit of a price for all that. But it is what it is. Stay out of this guy's way. And at some point, obviously, harvest would start, and we'd be out in the fields for several weeks, bringing it in. And you know, the combines here in in farming sim, I think the standard speed they have you run the harvest at is six miles an hour, and yeah, you just could not do that in grass seed. You know, it all depends on the capacity of the machine. So obviously, the bigger the machine, the quicker you can drive at any given width in the field you know that you're taking in but grass is just flat out generally harder to thresh than say wheat or barley or that kind of thing and you just can't drive here as fast and I'm not sure the six mile an hour speed in here that these combines run is accurate either I don't know what it would be in kilometers like I say, maybe with a, a narrow header kind of like this, that isn't taking too wide of a strip. So maybe a, even a little combine like this could keep scooting right along. But uh, I remember a few times when Lone Oak had some weed crops, and I think their 8820 John Deere combine had a, oh, was it an 18 foot header? And it didn't go no six miles an hour. Maybe it went three half of that but I suppose I mean if you enforced strict realism nobody would buy the game because things would get too boring I guess <laughs> anyway we'll let this guy do his thing I'm gonna take this in because that's the next thing we need to do to the 
field over here. Please come back, tractor. Don't get stuck. But for several weeks, uh, typically what it would be in those days, uh, Grandpa was, uh, he would run one of the machines, the best machine typically. He was usually in the 8820. And then I and uh, my cousins, a couple of them visiting from the Midwest, would run the other machines and we would handle the trucks, hauling the seed back to the warehouse. And then still others would help run the cleaner, grassy cleaners, which I described in a previous video. That's a mod I'd like to make someday, by the way, is a grassy cleaner. Don't know if it'll ever happen. And in Oregon in the summers, you know, we, uh, we get a lot of rain. We have pretty dreary winters. Um, we occasionally get some snow, but mostly it's rain. Excuse me. But in the summers, it's dry. And it gets hot here sometimes, but generally not overly hot. And what I like about our weather patterns here is typically in the the evenings, the the weather will, will get cool. You'll get a western breeze, and it'll chase all the heat away. And it usually doesn't get too muggy. And a lot of times it'll just flat out get chilly in the evenings. And I kind of like that. It makes it easier to sleep on summer nights. There's still homes here, my own included. You know, we don't even have air conditioning in our home. It's a lot of times it's just as efficient in the evenings to open the windows and let the breeze take the heat out of the house. And ooh, that's some arts. Just got another ding on the back. So in the seed came and. Right on the heels of that was other field work, you know, whether it was baling straw, some of the straw that we did, or burning the fields. I think I described that in a. Oops, no, 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 don't go down here. I think I described that in a, a separate video. That's how we would deal with the straw. And there was additional work later in the fall that I never was part of, you know, spraying the fields and fertilizing them, getting them ready for winter, that kind of thing. Earning participated on did a lot of that with Grandpa, and truthfully, it was a lot of fun. You know, I know there's been for years here. Well, the environmental lobby didn't like it, but kind of like I explained in a in the other video, it's it's a dual-edged sword, you know. It isn't that farmers just want to harm the environment. Um, sometimes you get a different benefit with a practice that you do that helps helps uh, preserve the environment. You know, my, my grandparents had a lot of steeper ground that they farmed on, and in certain areas where they farmed, the only thing they could put on there was basically grass. and if you didn't burn well you would then have to use more chemicals to take care of the pests and that you know obviously isn't good for the environment either and if you didn't burn uh you know there was a tendency for blind seed disease i think they called it to come in and ruin your crops so in order to prevent it if you didn't burn you'd have to rip the fields out more often and if you're on a steep slope with your arable land, well, every time you work it, there's the risk that the ensuing winter, the rains, or and what have you, will just wash your crop out of the ground and take your topsoil along with it and send it down the river. I mean, this happens all over the place. So sometimes putting a little smoke in the air helped you keep a crop on your steep ground longer than it otherwise would have been able and and so you trade a little smoke for preserving your topsoil and the health of the rivers with some of the runoff and whatnot 
there's always trade-offs to decisions it's you know in some ways it's really too bad and again I don't want to be political but so many decisions anymore it's such an us versus them mentality instead of you know just fellow countrymen trying to work together to do the best good for the highest number of people possible and sometimes you know decisions are just made in a vacuum because that's what our side whatever our side is wants and it's it's unfortunate when thinking is suspended for for politics really and I imagine that's not different no matter where you go around the world I know I have a aha this one here is going to storage apparently I'm still in the hole but you know what I'm just gonna let him take it to storage drive uh, don't go that way no 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 let me see at the out oh good grief why 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 you know I don't think I set this course up right there's supposed to be you know, maybe just need to start it further down the trail here so it can Oh, these ditches, my word. Okay, now he's heading into the field, I hope, so find the combine. Or we'll see. Alright, I'm gonna leave him to it. Combine's up here doing <laughs> whatever it's doing. Trying to find a place to cut in. And I got that to do, but I think I'm going to take the fuel home. No sense leaving it out here in this area. If I figure out how, maybe sometime I could show a video of, of pictures at least. I have a lot of old pictures of the farm. We put some in here, show people what it was like. This would have been back in the 90s, basically. You know, including what a field fire looks like. It's there's actually some science to it. You know, it's any fool can just go light a match and burn something down. But to try to do it smart, and that wasn't smart. Not very good driving there on my part. But there's ways to do it and ways not to do it for safety and for an effective burn. And I'm going to have to park him right there and go figure out why my tractor's off. Oh, it's kissing the fence again. The affection it has for fence posts and trees and so forth. Just remarkable, huh? Maybe I'll find him now. I think I'm gonna head up over the hill here. I think even closer to the farm. Years and years ago, the open field burning wasn't, uh, oops, I'm having trouble driving here, wasn't regulated. But at some point, you know, for public safety, I think the government decided to take a role in it. Much to the chagrin of the farmers, I don't think that they particularly cared for that regulation. But, but truth be told, it probably wasn't the worst thing to do. You know, nobody likes to be regulated, but 
Sometimes that's how you try to do the most good for the most number of people. Whoops, I'm gonna get squashed. Let me just try to help him out here and empty the machine. So when it wasn't regulated, the farmers could, you know, go out and light a, a field on fire anytime they pleased. And so once it started being regulated, I think what the government did is they kept a close watch on the weather patterns and they started only allowing farmers to burn basically when there was a rain due to come in. And obviously you can't burn it when it's raining, but the rain would usually come from the south or the west with the weather patterns in that area. And there would be winds way up high in the atmosphere that were blowing a certain way that if you lit a field fire, the smoke would rise and those winds would carry it completely out of the valley so the people locally didn't have to deal, it, deal with it. Now, <laughs> the smoke has to go somewhere and a lot of times it took it to other places, maybe less populated, a lot of it went into the mountains or, or whatever, but some of it ended up in other communities and they they weren't always wild about having it there either but like i say trying to do the most good for the highest number of, of people was the goal so by the time i was involved in the practice you know it was already under regulation so the farmers would be camped by their phones. We didn't have cell phones in those days. Grandpa had a car phone, as I recall. But that was some highfalutin technology to have at that time. You know, we just didn't have the cell phones. or So they would communicate by CB radio with the house a lot of times to, to be in contact with the authorities who would give. It was field by field where, you know, the farmer had to register it, pay a fee, and would eventually get the go-ahead to where they could burn a particular field. You know, they had to wait for permission as to timing as to when they would do it. And then once permission was given, there was a limited window of time to, to get it done. And so it was all hands on deck to, to get the job done. And so basically it was a huge flurry of activity hauling machinery to the field. And when I say machinery, and we're talking tractors with water tanks. Um, you know, a tank actually similar to the one that I'm driving down here that has had fuel in it. These would be old fuel tanks. A lot of times the farmers would take an old fuel tank and weld it onto a, a little trailer and uh, scrub it out and use a, a put water in it for, you know, for safety in the field. You always had to have some tractors with water tanks. So case the fire got into places it shouldn't go, uh, you had something to help put it out. Grandpa typically would start the fires. You know, I guess when you're the big cheese and the buck stops with you, you're the one that lights the match. And I was the one that held the torch, so uh, Grandpa would would uh, drive the pickup truck, and I would hold this drip torch on the back of the pickup, kind of on the tailgate, and he would drive wherever he wanted the fire, and he had a, a system where, oops, got to remove the combine assignment, and depending on how he honked his horn. I would know whether to raise the torch, lower it, when to put it out, kind of some of those kinds of things. And if that didn't work, uh, well, <laughs> he would always bark orders. So Grandpa was very good at that. Just like this tractor is good at finding fences. And this isn't good because the combine is already full. But there was a method to the madness. 
you know, kind of like I said, any fool can burn something down. But to do it properly, you know, required a little bit of thinking. You know, you had the the atmospheric winds way up high. We didn't worry about the O's too much, though we did want them there so it would carry the smoke up. But down on the on the surface, you know, we had what we called service winds or surface winds, and fire has this annoying tendency of making its own winds. So we would start the fire with whatever regular winds were already in place, you know, just around in the field. And and so like if it was if the wind was coming from the west and blowing east, we would go clear to the eastern side of the field and that's where we would start the fire. We didn't want to start it on the western side because the winds would just whip it all over the field in a fury and just scorch everything and then you never know what's going to happen when the fire reaches the opposite side of the field. A lot of these fields were surrounded kind of like this map here, there's a lot of trees and and they were tinder dry, I mean a lot of times this is in August, September and so if you screw up you, you have a major problem potentially on your hands. So we would start it over the far eastern side if it was coming in from the west and then we would make what we would call a backfire and just a strip at a time sometimes just a few feet carefully burning strips over and over again until we had a buffer zone on the far edge of the field so that if the wind you know it would make it less likely to carry uh, fire across the buffer zone and, and to cause trouble like off in the woods but, but like I said fire makes its own wind sometimes and it's really I'm sure there are people that study this and maybe know the hows and the whys it's probably the heat and what that does to pull uh, pull air from one area to another because fire it needs food you know it, it requires air air in order to do what it does so and it's going to get air, and it, if it doesn't have it, it's going to suck it from wherever it can get it. And you can just feel it, you know, when you're standing in this field and when you have a, a fire, you can feel the wind rush to go forward to, to feed that fire. So we would be backfiring this stuff in, in these little strips, and sometimes even those little strips could cause troubles. And there was a lot of whirlwinds that would happen and those are pretty scary you see a, a whirlwind come through kind of almost like a mini tornado and it would pick up straw you know that was burning and pick it up throw it way up in the air and sometimes carry it off into areas where you didn't want it to be namely brush and trees and the neighbors wheat standing wheat say and so you know, there were a number of times where even as careful as we tried to be, the fire would end up in places where where we didn't want it to be. And, I mean, that's that just sometimes happened. I should probably get going on this over here instead of just jabbering. And... You know, a lot of times we sit on these tractors and you figure, well, I could squirt this water a certain distance and put it out. And But a lot of times, just like on this map here, you look in to the left there and you see the fence. There's fences all over in private property and, and sometimes you're burning next to a fence. There's a pasture and trees and, and the fire is supposed to stay on our side of the fence, but what if it doesn't? And then what do you do? And there occasionally was a few times where there was a dangerous enough situation they simply took the tractors and ran them right through the fence because they had to get over there to put something out. But obviously, if we knew where the gate was or could get to it quick enough, you know, we would choose it at that alternative. Probably one of the worst ones that I remember was, uh, it was standing wheat and standing wheat if anybody's familiar with farming or you, you see it here in the game i mean it is tinder dry you know you you can practically look at it crossways and and it'll burn so it's really a ticklish thing to burn a field of grass right next to standing wheat and 
like I say, it doesn't take much, and you got the fire and the wheat, and that happened a time or two. And sometimes you call the fire department, they'll put it out. Other times you got to knuckle under and take care of it ourselves. But in spite of all that, I really enjoyed it. You know, then once we would get done with the backfire, you know, we would check the winds again, see where they're coming from. Maybe somewhere else we'd have to do a backfire if the wind direction had changed. And once you had your buffers and own in place, that's when we would take the, we would torch the entire field. You'd basically what they call it is just ring it. So we would run, there'd usually be a couple of us doing it. Grandpa would take me on the pickup and we'd zip along the edges of the field to light the rest of the field on fire along the outer edges. And it's just amazing to watch wind work on that fire. And I think we all intuitively know if you, you give flammable material to a fire and then blow behind it, you know, it doesn't take much of that fire to just take it over, and it's an inferno. And it, uh, we were always careful to make sure everybody got out of the field before it was finally ringed. You know, whatever you did not want to be is anywhere on that field when, when it was ringed. Because the reality is you could not get out of it soon enough, or quick enough. It would just, it would go faster than a car could drive faster than a guy could run you you basically were dead if you were in there um, so we always tried to be very careful that everybody got out before you'd ring it and then it was just amazing like I say fire creates kind of its own like its own microcosm or climate almost I don't know if it's the heat and you get that much together and I don't care what part of the field you were standing next to, the wind would just rush in from every single edge. I mean, we're talking a wind from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. All of it just zipping in as the fire basically sucks the air in to feed itself and to burn that field off. And it sure didn't take long. I mean, you, you lit it and you saw the fire go zipping towards the center. Eventually, the and, and the the wind coming in, it would draw it in to burn, and it would send it sky high with the smoke. So it's like all the wind zipped in from every side, took the fire with it, and then took the smoke high up into the atmosphere. That was kind of the ultimate thing that you wanted to have happen, you know, when when you were burning the field. You know, just an amazing thing to see that dynamic kind of how it worked. And then ideally all you're left with was a black field. We're talking coal black. And that's what you're aiming for. And the amazing thing is, is assuming it was a right kind of seed to be burning, um, it'd be a, a, a week or two down the road, especially if a rain came through. And a lot of times the rain did, kind of like I mentioned, for the timing or the regulation of uh, when they would do these things. Oop, my tractor's slipping again. And so a rain would come through, and before you knew it, the seed is all, or the grass is all greening back up again, and it's just amazing. It would just grow back. you think you just killed it, and, and no. It was uh, regrowing, and it was healthy for it. Now, Tractor, why are you doing this? Can you help me understand? All right, you want to go this way? <laughs> now you want to go that way. So that's kind of the, some of the things we would do after harvest. And I think I mentioned earlier, nowadays there's... There's less open field burning because somewhere in there, there came to be a market for the straw. And now, even with some of the downsides of not burning, it's uh, there's value, enough value in the straw that it's worth it to not burn it. And it's kind of in some ways a win-win. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, that live in the area that really hated the, the open field burning. 
and would complain every summer and the you know public offices were filling up with complaints and years ago I still remember it happened I almost think it was 1987 or whatever it was I remember it as a kid there was uh, there used to be open field burning clear down in the valley and we have a major interstate that runs through there and a farmer was burning next to the interstate a number of cars came through and there was a pile up you know I don't maybe seven cars I don't know if any lost their lives I can't remember those details but I think that that particular event was a catalyst for some other changes and um, some heavier regulation on it and but like I say a, a market developed for the straw and now there isn't even a desire to do as much uh, field earnings as there was in the past kind of a win-win for for everybody so now they they do a lot more straw which is hay for uh, some of the cattlemen in, in uh, South Korea Japan wherever else they send it but I never, back in the day when I worked on the farm, I didn't, didn't do that part all that much. Well, I've kind of lost track of the time again. I don't even know how long this video is. Um, so I'm wondering if I should call it here and pick it up with, uh, with a different one. Thank you for watching, and I hope I'm not uh, boring anybody to tears. Just trying to continue with the harvest here on good old Gelvin Valley. We can watch the day go by, and there's our little hillside combine hard at work. I'll drop it here and talk to you guys again soon. Thank you.